Okay, in the previous lectures, we've talked about um, Maxwell materials and Kelvin Voigt materials. What we want to do here is explore how each of those two materials behaves uh, under a com creep compliance test. So in a creep compliance test, remember, we're going to apply um, uh, sudden stress, call it sigma naught, and observe how the strain behaves uh, holding that stress constant. So we're going to apply sigma naught and observe the strain response holding sigma naught constant. Okay, that's our goal. And we could compute the creep compliance j as a function of t is equal to epsilon t divided by sigma naught. Okay, so that's what we're trying to, to solve for. I also want to, so we're going to, we're going to go ahead now th and work through each um, of the simple viscoelastic models, the Maxwell model first, and then we'll go to the Kelvin Voigt model. So uh, I'm going to say, recall our governing equation for the Maxwell model. So for the Maxwell model, and if you want me to draw it for you really quickly, it's just a, a, sp a spring in series with a dash pot that has, spring has a, modulus or a stiffness E and the dash pot has, is described by its viscosity eta. Okay. So we had uh, said in previously that we, we could write that eta times epsilon dot is equal to eta over E times sigma dot plus sigma. That was our governing equation. We'll call that equation one. Okay, so how about this test? So, right, during this test, during this uh, uh, creep test, uh, sigma is going to be constant, uh, which means that sigma dot in the above equation is going to go to zero, and sigma is going to go to sigma naught. So we're end up, so the equation for this particular case is going to look like eta times epsilon dot is going to be equal to sigma naught. Let's call that equation two. Okay. So now, what, what do we want to do? Well, we want to solve this equation so we can just integrate it. So integrating, we integral eta epsilon dot dt is equal to the integral of sigma naught dt. Uh, we can go ahead and eta being constant, pull that out. And this becomes eta times epsilon is going to be equal to sigma naught times t, and then plus this constant of integration, call it c1. Okay, so let's call that equation three. So all we did was we integrated that. We can rearrange this a little bit and and write this. Uh, let me just say rearranging here. And all I'm really doing is dividing by eta to get that epsilon is a function of t, which is what we need in this case. It's going to be equal to sigma naught over eta times t plus uh, I'm going to write c1 again because I can I haven't solved for what c1 is yet, so I can just leave it as a as some constant I need to solve for. Okay, so call that equation four. Now we need the initial condition to solve for C1. So need an initial condition to solve for C1. Okay. Okay, so the problem, right, is that the stress is discontinuous right? Because it's, it's sigma is going to be equal to zero for all t less than zero. And uh, then sigma is going to be equal to sigma naught for all t greater than or equal to zero. So at t equals zero, it kind of gives us a problem. So what that implies is that sigma dot um, has a singularity. at t equals zero. Um, 
So what do we need to do? We're going to integrate. I'm going to try this anyway. We're going to try integrating over the singularity. Okay. Um, and specifically, I want to integrate the, the original equation, right? So the original equation said that I'm going to integrate now from negative tau to tau. Uh, so that's tau being some number I'm, I'm integrating now. Zero falls in the middle. Uh, uh, we have eta uh, times epsilon dot dt. And then I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Integral from negative tau to tau of eta over e times sigma dot plus sigma. Okay, I'm going to integrate that with respect to time. Okay, so and then ultimately I'm going to take the limit here as we as we go. But but this look, looks like eta times epsilon of tau minus epsilon of tau. And that's going to be equal to, uh, I'm going to do this in pieces now, the integral of eta over epsilon, we can pull that out, eta over epsilon, times, now the integral of sigma dot is just sigma, so this becomes sigma tau minus sigma of negative tau. And then this next term is plus the integral from negative tau to tau of sigma dt. Okay? So that's, the, that's, that's our integrating over that. Now let's go ahead and take the limit uh, as tau goes to zero. Okay? And if we do that, what happens here? Well, this... Oops, this should be a negative tau. There you go. We know that the strain before zero, that is identically zero. We also know that the stress before zero is identically zero. And we know that if tau goes to zero, this is integral integrating something that's finite over a, over a domain of zero. So this thing goes to zero. And we're left with eta times epsilon evaluated at zero is equal to eta over e times sigma evaluated at zero, which becomes sigma naught. And so then we have our initial condition, which is that epsilon at zero is equal to sigma naught over e, right? Which makes sense. All it says is that all of our strain resides in the uh, spring on that initial load up. Okay, so this isn't too surprising. So let's go ahead. We'll call this equation five. So now what we want to do is we want to substitute equation five into equation four, solve it for t equals zero, and then evaluate um, uh, evaluate c one. Okay. So now we're going to say substitute five into four and set t equal to zero and solve for c1. Okay, so uh, setting that equal to zero uh, on the, the left hand side is just gonna be sigma naught over e equals, and let's go back up and look at that really quick. What does that equation look like? So that's e zero. Sigma naught over eta times, if I set t equals zero, that just goes to nothing. And we're left with then that just equals C1. Okay. So that's equation six. Go ahead and substitute six uh, into four. And we now have the equation that we wanted. So let's go back up here and look at what that says. That says... Uh, Epsilon t is going to equal, be equal to sigma naught over eta times t plus sigma naught over e. Okay. So this now says that epsilon t is going to be equal to sigma naught over eta times t plus sigma naught over e. 
And if we want to continue to pull that out, that looks like sigma naught times t over eta plus 1 over e. We can call that equation 7. And then we can write it in terms of creep compliance. So the creep compliance J is going to be equal to E of T divided by sigma naught. So if we do that, uh, it just ends up looking like 1 over eta times T plus 1 over E. Okay, so what does that look like? That means that if I were to draw a picture of how the strain behaves, note that this is linear in time. Okay, so uh, plotting uh, equation 7 looks something like this. So this is time. There's our strain. Right? So we jump up initially to this quantity sigma naught over e, and then we increase linearly with a slope that is equal to uh, 1 over eta. Okay? Uh, sorry, sigma naught over eta. So that is uh, what the, the uh, creep compliance curve looks like. Uh, the creep compliance is j of t and is a linear function in in time. So this is how the Maxwell model behaves under a creep compliance test. So we'll keep that in mind. And now let's go ahead and move on to the Kelvin Voigt model. Okay, in the case of the... So let me just write this down. This will be the Kelvin Voigt model now. Okay. Let me remind you of the of the governing equation for that. Uh, the governing equation for the for the Kelvin Voigt model uh, simply looked like um, sigma is equal to uh, e epsilon plus eta times epsilon dot. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and call that equation nine, and we want to. Do, we want to solve for the same the same thing, okay? So, uh, so at same thing here at t equals zero, we apply a a constant stress of sigma naught, okay? So, so what does this look like? This says that uh, let me rearrange. This says that eta times epsilon dot plus E times epsilon is equal to sigma naught, right? Um, we can we can do a little uh, algebra and divide by eta. This looks like epsilon dot plus e over eta times epsilon is equal to sigma naught. Let's call that equation ten. Oops, I better better make sure that we divide. Sigma naught by eta as well. Okay, and let me just remind you uh, of, of a picture of what this element looks like. Right, it looked like these spring and dash pot elements in parallel. Right, so that would be e, and that would be eta. Okay. Okay, so what is our goal here? We want to be able to solve this equation, and what kind of equation is it? So note that it looks like a differential equation. It's not equal to zero, so it's an inhomogeneous differential equation. So to solve that, we need to find the homogeneous solution and then the particular solution. So let's, let's uh, go ahead and do that. So we begin uh, by finding the homogeneous solution. Okay. So that means we're going to solve the equation epsilon dot uh, plus e over eta times epsilon is going to be equal to zero, right? That's that's the homogeneous uh, equation that we have to solve. We can just uh, write this as d epsilon dt 
do a little separation of variables plus e over eta times epsilon equals zero. Uh, I can go ahead and write that as uh, doing a little algebra d epsilon over e is going to be equal to. I'm just bringing this to the other side and then dividing by e multiplying times I have this now e over eta negative uh, dt. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and integrate both sides. And because I'm only dealing with positive strains in this case, I'm only going to, I can write this just as the natural log of epsilon. On the other side is going to look like negative e over eta times t uh, plus some constant of integration, call it c1. Okay, so uh, I can go ahead and uh, raise both sides at uh, e to the power of both sides, and then this becomes epsilon. I'm going to put an h subscript there to remind you it's the homogeneous solution. is going to be equal to uh, c1 times e to the negative e over eta times t. Okay, and let's see, what equation am I on? Let's call that equation 12. Okay, equation 12. So now that we have the uh, homogeneous solution, we next need to find the particular solution. So let's write that down. Uh, now we find the particular solution, or next. Uh, we find the particular solution. Okay, and in this case, we're going to just guess the particular solution, which I'm going to call epsilon p, not to be confused with the plastic strain, but the particular solution of this particular strain. And we can, we can look at the differential equation and maybe take a guess that it's just some constant value that we'll call A. If we do that, uh, then equation 10 uh, right, uh, becomes, that's, that's the original differential equation, that becomes E over eta times A is equal to sigma naught over eta. Uh, and then we can, of course, find that uh, a is going to be equal to sigma naught over E, which is our particular solution. Let's call that equation 13. Okay? So all we need to do for the total solution is add uh, equations 12 and 13. Okay? So uh, to get the complete solution, uh, we're going to add 12 and 13. And 13. Okay, so then we can write that the total strain epsilon is equal to the homogeneous uh, component plus the particular component, which is going to be equal to then C1 e to the negative e over eta times t plus sigma naught over e. Okay, so we'll call that equation 14. Okay, so what do we need next? Well, we need to figure out how to solve for C1. To do that, we need an, an initial condition. So now we want to develop the initial condition. Okay, so now let's develop the initial condition. I'm just going to call it the IC, initial condition. And what do we want to say? Well, if, uh, if the strain in the dash pot, I'm going to put E sub D there, if the strain in the dash pot jumped instantaneously, upon the application of the load, okay, if it jumped instantaneously, um, then, then what's going to happen? Then that's going to imply that the strain rate in the dash pot, which uh, remember in this is the same as the strain rate total, if that's the case, then that strain rate on that initial jump is going to go to infinity if it jumped instantaneously. We know based on the dash pot equation that if the strain rate went to infinity, that would imply that our stress would go to infinity, which can't happen. Okay, so since this can't happen, so because sigma does not go to infinity, um, the dash pot doesn't jump instantaneously. And then correspondingly, the strain does not jump instantaneously. Okay? So instantaneously. 
So what does that imply? If the strain doesn't jump instantaneously, that says that the initial strain started out at nothing, and it remains at nothing instantly. Okay, so the initial strain is zero. So now we can go ahead, let's call that equation 15. We're going to apply equation 15 to equation 14. So apply equation 15 to 14 and solve for C1. Pretty straightforward. And we can find that C1 is going to be equal to negative sigma naught over E. Call that equation 16. And now let's go ahead and substitute uh, 16 into 14. So substitute 16 into 14 to get our final strain time uh, response. Okay, so we end up with epsilon now as a function of t, and I can factor out the sigma naught over e times 1 minus e uh, to the negative e over eta t. There you have it. Let's call that equation 17. So there's the, there's the strain time response. So as with the Maxwell material, we can also here compute the creep compliance. So we then compute the creep compliance just in the standard way. So the creep compliance Uh, is going to be given just by j as a function of t equals epsilon t divided by sigma naught, which in this case we can just look at equation 7 and see that looks like 1 over e times the quantity 1 minus e to the negative e over eta times t. Okay, I'll call that equation 18. Um, and what do we observe from this? Well, Let's let's think through that a little bit. What happens as t goes to infinity is that that exponential term goes to zero, and we're left with uh, one over e as our as our uh, as our creep compliance. So let me just write that here. Observe that uh, as t goes to infinity, then uh, j of t is going to go to 1 over e, and the strain is going to go to some fixed value of strain, right? So if this is my strain term, it's going to go to sigma naught over e. So what does that mean? That means that, therefore, e uh, is called the as asymptotic modulus, and the behavior of the strain is such that it's an exponential that that uh, is actually bounded and, and grows to some asymptotic value. In contrast to the Maxwell material, remember, which grew linearly in an unbounded way. Okay? So let's draw a picture of that. Okay, so what does the strain time curve look like? So the strain uh, time curve uh, for the for the, uh, the Kelvin Voigt material, right? So the strain time curve is going to look like something like this. So here's time. We know it starts out at zero and it grows, but it approaches some value. We're going to call that epsilon infinity, right? Which is equal to sigma naught over e. And let's go ahead and draw this as sort of a straight line. Okay, that's our asymptote that we're going to approach. So we grow initially rapidly, and then we decay, approaching this asymptotic value, something like that. Okay? Let me give you a couple concluding remarks. Okay? About both of these materials. Number one, that the Maxwell material gives us an initial elastic response plus uh, some linear creep compliance. So uh, Maxwell material uh, gives initial oops, gives a linear elastic response right plus a linear uh, creep compliance okay what but there's a there's a little bit of a problem what 
uh, from the perspective of viscoelastic behavior, but any of the time-dependent strain, right? So it's strain beyond that initial uh, strain jump. So, but the time-dependent strain is not recoverable, right? It's simply a plastic component. It's actually not a viscoelastic element. It's a viscoplastic element. So the, the strain that accumulates is not recoverable uh, after, after time t, and it can grow without limit, right? There's nothing that says how far it can grow. It just grows linearly forever and for always, right? So, and it can grow without limit. So there's a little bit of a, of a challenge with respect to um, uh, using this Maxwell material directly, uh, as there is also for the Kelvin Voigt material. So there's, there's, there's some issues there. How about for the Kelvin Voigt material? So let's look at that. Okay, so uh, for the Kelvin Voigt material, uh, what can we say about it? Well, first off, it gives no initial elastic response. Okay, which is also not very physical. Okay gives no initial elastic response, okay? But on the plus side for it, it, it yields a bounded time-dependent strain, okay? So it can't grow forever, uh, but it yields a bounded, right? It's bounded just in this curve up here by epsilon infinity, so it yields a bounded time-dependent strain, okay? And what else can we say about this strain? Well, remember that the Kelvin void element is a dash pot in series with a spring. So if you let off the load, the spring itself will tend to bring uh, that um, the strain back to zero to its original configuration, so that uh, it gives us a bounded time-dependent strain that is also recoverable. So it acts does act in an elastic fashion that it will return to its original configuration. So that is recoverable. Okay. Again, we, we rarely use these two elements simply by themselves because of these deficiencies that each, uh, each of them have. So we want to figure out maybe a way uh, in, in future lectures to think about what is a, maybe a better type of material uh, uh, to, to, um, to, to handle a more realistic material behavior. And the last thing that I wanted to say was just to bring your attention, let me scroll up real quick, to this term. You see this exponential, negative e over eta times t, okay? So I want to say finally that, um, okay, the units of, uh, of e over eta are 1 over time, okay? so. Uh, what that implies is that we could write some time tau as equal to eta over e, which we would call potentially a characteristic time. Or sometimes you'll see it called uh, a retardation time. Okay? And so if we, if we use the value of tau, then, then e to the negative uh, e over eta times t uh, is going to be equal to e to the negative t over the characteristic time tau. Okay? So just be aware of that those that, that is a is a characteristic time and it's it's governed by the combination of the, the ratio rather of the uh, uh, the viscosity and and the modulus associated with it in this case. Okay?